this session, we talk about exception rate of the revision. So we will assuming that we already submit a paper and we have been inviting to submit a revision. But some of the tips and hints and conversation in this session will be useful for conference paper or the first round of submission as well, because we're going to talk about a few other aspects. Is it important for us to know the birthday of the editor? So uh, if anyone thinks it's important, please feel free to put in a chat section as well. Or is it more important to know the journal that you are targeting? So in terms of, uh, now in the past, myself, I have tried to get to know some editor in the past. There were, there were times that when I was, especially I was a PhD student, when I went to a conference, I, I have, I heard from some people that it is very important when we go to the conference and we get to meet one or two of the key people and get to know the person. And hopefully the, those one or two people, people can be able to support you in the future in terms of job, in terms of uh, you know, publish, publish in a journal. But from my experience, knowing the editor, that it doesn't mean that we can get paper accepted because just be knowing the editor. What is more importantly is to know the editor style, but also know the journal style as well, which we're gonna have a look right now. So first of all, what could upset the editor? We're gonna talk about what could upset the editor. So this is the editor of the journal, normally, um, and it could apply to any discipline, okay? So first of all, there are many type of editor and many role of editor. This is something that we should learn before we submit a paper to any journal. There is an editor in chief who is making the final decision or the overall decision of the journal. Then there is an AE, which is stand for associate editor. Most of the journal will have an AE or more than one AE to look after a specific area or specific uh, aspect. Normally in marketing journal, associate editor will be the one that make a recommendation on the decision of the journal, whether to accept or reject. And it's breaking the two style, which is the AE, whether the AE can make the final decision on herself or himself, by himself or herself. Or the AE make the recommendation to reject or not reject. And then the editor in chief make that decision. And then there is a regional editor for some big journal, like really big journal, right? Like European Journal of Marketing, A Star Journal, or Journals such as like a, a journal of business research, those have things that have a regional editor or a senior associate editor who will make a decision on um, who will be the associate editor, who will be the reviewer and so on. Now, the reason why it's quite important for us to understand each of these roles is so that we know who is making the decision. And therefore, if we can understand their style, their preference, it will give us an upper hand. So for example, some specific associate editor might like their paper to have a very strong practical implication as well as a theoretical implication. So this is something that we should learn and explore throughout our experience. And obviously, if you know who is the editor that's going to handle your journal, uh, probably because of the subject area that you're looking at into it. So you, we can refer to some of their paper or create some conversation what, with what they already have done in the past. Another thing to look at is a KPI of the journal. This is something that is quite important and been, not been talked a lot uh, in terms of the KPI of the journal. A lot of the time when we look at a KPI of the journal is come from the publisher of the journal, which is say, for example, um, the time in the review, how long it have to be you know, published before, you know, since it's submitted into the system, how long the review system going to be, how many time, how many around the review, the, the, the paper is in the review system or in terms of the impact factor of the journal. The one that actually um, impact us as an author is a time in review. There are some journals, talking about big journals, that will reject paper just because the paper has been in the system for too long or go into the review system for too long. I have came across a few experience with myself that some of my paper got rejected in the third round of review just because um, one of the reviewers still think is a major revision. I had a conversation with the journal editor. He or she told me that is because of they can't just keep the paper in the system forever. So what we should try to do here, if we know that some of the journal is have these rules, is that we try to make sure that our paper can be, you know, can answer all the questions of the reviewer before it's, you know, go for too many rounds. 
Uh, in terms of the reputation of the journals, they also quite um, make a big impact. Now, just to be frank, the word reputation of the journal here, what the journal editors want from us as an author is that sometimes they want us to cite their paper, basically to create a reputation to the journal, just to be, you know, cut short. Another word, you can, you can use the word that create the conversation with the current, you know, journal. So basically that citation that we refer to the paper, to the journal, uh, what is very important, which is one of the key contribution, is the key contribution that the, our paper will be offering. This is something that we're going to talk about in the early, in the second half of today's session, in terms of creating the original contribution from your, your for your paper, and also creating the extra contribution during the revision process. The word extra contribution is a key to make sure that your paper will be accepted almost every time. Um, other thing that could upset the editor is the removing and adding author during the revision process. If possible, please try your best not to add anyone or remove anyone. Now, adding some people, uh, you can justify with it in terms of, okay, this new person have a knowledge in so-and-so methodology that you have just added in, therefore you can, you know, you know recruit, recruit this new person not too bad but some of the publisher will have to you have to write some letter and all that so it just creates some you know extra burden to the editor so sometimes they just feel not good with it um the one that we really piss the editor off as well as the publisher off is to remove some author especially in the revision round so this is something that can potentially create problem to the journal editor and uh the publisher uh, if the one that got removed made a big fuss about it, basically made a complaint and all that. So most of the journal editor will have a red flag when someone removing an author out of that paper. So we have to be really careful uh, in that instead. Now, can I disagree with a journal editor? Um, how many of us here in, in this session have agreed, disagree with a journal editor before? Please feel free to put in the chat section. Um, in my past experience, there was just one time that I had a disagreement with a journal editor. I mean, I have many times that a disagreement, but only one time that I reached out to the journal editor and saying that, hey, look, I think this is, you know, we have we need to have a conversation. So it, to, to me, I think we can have a disagreement and we can talk about it. So you remember the example of, I say, one of the journal have a KPI that they have to accept the paper within how many rounds of review. One of my paper, link back to that story is rejected in the third round. Basically, one reviewer say accept, one reviewer say major revision. And the editor say, oh, because of, you know, the other uh, reviewer say major revision and it's very hard to complete, you know, do the comment. So my team have written a very long explanation on what we could do. And eventually the, the editor have made the decision that he or she will change from the rejection to a major revision and let us do one more round of review. And uh, eventually that paper got accepted. So the decision was reversed from a rejection to major revision, then to an exception. Now that paper, after negotiation with the editor, I feel like um, that paper did well, but I feel like in the long term, I feel that the journal editor actually disliked me to a, to a level because of that negotiation and then talk to the editor in, in the fashion that I think that was something that is unfair and then flag that to the journal editor. So to me, I think we might also have to think of the long term as well, but what is your long term goal with that specific journal? Do you, is, it, is this a very niche journal that you have to keep targeting and keep sending your paper there? If so, we might want to make sure that you not compromise any relationship with the journal editor because we are here for the long, long, long-term plan. So you don't want to accept anyone. And obviously, when you talk to the editor, you will use listening. You will try to listening with the editor and you will use example and some other things. You will not try to argue, but you're gonna, you know, try to use some reason with that. So out of my experience, I feel like if I know some of the editor will act too strongly, I will try not to uh, talk to the person. I will just let it go. But if I think it's really unfair, then I will have a conversation with it. Now, what can kick me off to have a chat with the editor tend to be about my PhD student. Because let's say if their work have been in a review for too long and they need some of that work to be published, 
And if I feel like it's unfair, that is when I reach out to the editor. Normally, in other cases, I would not. So, but you know, we have to be able to manage our emotion and all that. Now, moving on, can I ask for an extension when we submit a paper to a regular issue? The answer is yes. A lot of people have asked in the past, like, can we ask for an extension? And then they reluctant to do that. Now, for myself and many of us in this room who have experiences as an editor, uh, there is no harsh feeling at all if you need to have some extra time for a regular issue. Um, but if some of you are journal discipline, um, very strict, you know, very strict, sorry, not strict, it's strict with the time and everything like that, you might have to think twice before you um, ask for the extension. What we should not ask for extension is a special issue. When we submit a paper to a special issue, because myself, like I said, I have done a special issue as a guest editor 10 times or more than that. Um, what is very important about most of the special issue, I, I would say 80% of the special issue need to fix in a specific date of publishing with the publisher. So therefore, the guest editor have the pressure that they have to accept or reject some paper before a certain day. Most of the publishers are, are like that. Now, there might be some very special case of special issue that there is no fixed date of the publishing of that specific issue. So in that type of cases, we have no issue that you, know, you ask for extension. But when I came across most of the journal special issue, we have a fixed date that the paper must be accepted or rejected before. Um, and if you come across some of those, which you probably will, the guest editor can do two things. First is to reject the paper just because they think the paper will not finish in time for them to have it in that special issue. The second option that the guest editor could do is to have a chat with the journal editor of that journal. Say, hey, look, this is a good paper, but they need extension and they're not gonna make it in time for our special issue. Can this be published in a regular issue? And myself, I would prefer the second option. But when I talk to most of my editor friends, they would go with the first option because you can see that it suddenly add the burden and it's add the extra workload and negotiation to the guest editor because the guest editor might already have a few things that they have to think about. So the, the learning point in here is that once we submit a paper to a special issue, Make sure that you learn that timeline. Make sure that you talk to the guest editor openly and say, if you need extension, how many days can you give you? So, so try to, um, but best try to manage on your time and try to not ask for exact extension when it's come to a special issue. Unless the journal asks you to, you know, correct more data, correct more, you know, put in another um, data set or something like that. Now, what could upset the publisher? I would believe that most of us who are who are in this session might not have not heard about this section yet. I have worked with some publisher before, so I actually know what are some of the things that could upset the publisher. And the thing that would upset publisher the most is the cost, because they are here for business. You know, uh, the publisher elsewhere, you know, Emerald, everything else, Sage and all that, they are here for, for business. This is a business model. When you talk about cost with the publisher, we are talking about the, the, the journal itself. So how the journal work is that they had made an agreement with the publisher on how many pages that they're going to publish uh, in an issue. Uh, every year, there will be say four to 12 or whatever issue. Issue is like one set of the, the you know, every time the paper published is called one issue. So let's say in that issue, the journal editor might have made an agreement that they're going to do 300 pages in that issue. Therefore, they cannot do 301 page because sometimes, depending on the uh, agreement, the editor in chief of that journal have to pay for that extra cost or the uh, organization that back up that journal, we have to pay. Therefore, the cost of the pages is very important, especially in the old day. But now in the new age, it's like published in online. So it's not that important, but this tradition still continue to this, to this day. 
Therefore, this cost here, what is relevant to us as an author is to do with the word count, is to do with the word limit of each of the paper that we do. Most of the journal in business is, will be 8,000 words. If you go more than 8,000 words, that's fine, but it just reduces the pages that the, the editor can publish in that specific uh, issue. So that is to do with the cost. Next thing is to do with the reputation of the journal. Uh, this one actually not relevant much, but it's obviously is touched there because it's to do with the impact factor, um, which lead to the citation, how many times the paper have been cited, that journal have been cited and all that. Um, yeah. Lastly, is again to do with removing and adding author. And the publisher actually take it even more serious than the journal, the editor of some journal, because uh, if something happened, then the publisher could get into trouble as well. Therefore, some of the publisher like Emerald, we have a specific form if you want to remove or adding journals, uh, adding authors. And in fact, uh, most of the paper journal that I know in Emerald will be very strict when we add in a new author or remove an author in the second round or third round review. They even freeze um, or, or disable some of that function, like adding an author function for those journals. Like you have to send an email to the editor to add in an author name for, for some of the selected journal that I have came across. So we should avoid those. Now, come to the point of those who are going to recommend our journal to be accepted or rejected from the reviewer perspective. First is acknowledgement. So this acknowledgement is to do with we as an author acknowledge the reviewer comment. Now, I want to give you one example here that I got recently. Um, this is in the second round of review. So the story go like this. In the second round, uh, in the second round of review, one of the reviewer recommend accepting the paper, which is my, my team paper. Another reviewer recommend rejecting the paper. However, in the first round of review, the second reviewer actually recommend minor revision. So we can see here, minor revision in the first round changed to a reject in the second round. Why is that the reason? The reason, there is actually, this story have a big story. <laughs> this one have a big story behind. So the second reviewer, if you uh, see in the text here, the reviewer, the second reviewer saying that me or the team have ignored his or her comment and have resubmit the paper in a very short period of time. But the main problem here is that the second review will say all the comments that he or she provided in his PDF have been overlooked. Therefore, he or she cannot agree for this specific paper to be published. What is saying here, the review was saying that, oh, this guy did not consider my comment at all and ignore every comment. Therefore, I think this paper should be rejected. Now, this reviewer might be fair to a good level, to a good level that the author did not follow the comment. This is an author fault. But at the same time, I also feel that this reviewer used too much emotions. However, if I were to be in his or her shoe, I might feel the same thing, that someone did not acknowledge any of the comment or suggestion. The problem with this journal, what happened was that when this paper, uh, when the uh, first decision have sent to the author, you will notice that there's a word PDF. What happened was that there were a list of comments written in the email, but the PDF file did not send out to the author. So the author actually did not receive the PDF file from the first place. And the author team in this case have received about three pages of comment from these two reviewer, but mainly from reviewer one, have done all the comment, but the comment from reviewer two actually very short. So therefore the author team actually sent an email to the journal editor to ask whether have there been anything missing. In this case, a missing PDF file, a p missing comment in the PDF file. But during that time, it was a Christmas time. So the editor was on leave and uh, no one answered to the email for a week. So the second email actually sent out to the journal again, but since it's still during the Christmas period, it's fair to assume that the editor will not reply to the email. And also the team of this paper wait until very, very last minute before they submit, you know, there's a revision. So what happened also is that the revision deadline is actually already reached to the deadline and there's no comment from the editor. So therefore, the team actually rushed the paper and submit the, the revision without waiting, the re, the, without waiting for the editor to even get back. So therefore, when they submit the, the revision, 
you know, the next round here is the result. The result of not waiting for the editor to get back whether there is a problem or not. What we can learn from this case is that it actually does not matter if we submit a paper to a regular issue and we are about to run out of time. If you have a problem, talk to the editor first. If you think there is a file missing, talk to the editor first. Otherwise, someone else will be upset. So if you talk to the editor in this case, I would assume that he or she, as in the editor, will give us one or two weeks extra to work on the PDF file that is have been missing. Second one is the language that we use. It have to be very, um, second thing that is important for a reviewer, uh, the language that we use uh, have to be very polite. We will talk about it after this. Basically, thank you so much for this and that, and then acknowledge that comment as in like, okay, we have done so and so as per your uh, suggestion. Here is a page number that we change, or sometimes you can copy and paste uh, what you change into your things. Time management. Remember, I told you about the time management that I have made a big mistake in this part before. Um, uh, about two years ago, two years each ago, uh, when I submitted one of the paper, the problem was this. In the first round of review, the editor and the three, there were four people commenting, the editor and then the three other reviewer. The comment was very difficult to follow. Sorry, very, very difficult to execute. And the solution to that was to re-correct uh, data, do more data collection and all that. And it was a very niche paper. So the people that we had to collect data were actually quite hard. But the point was that we could not finish the paper on time in the second round of review. Therefore, we asked for uh, asked for extension. We got the extension. Uh, eventually, we submit the revision. It's come back the third round. And we had to do something else more. And we could not finish on time again with the timeline that they have. We asked for the second extension. And eventually, at that point, uh, the research team, we did have some disagreement that we should not ask for extension. But there's no point we submit a paper without uh, significant rework on something because the paper will be rejected. So eventually the paper really got rejected. And we also assuming largely because of the timing that I mentioned earlier, that because we keep asking for extension, the paper was reviewed, the, the time that it was in the review process was more than one year, uh, including the extension time. Obviously this is where exit this special issue time limit and all that. So. Um, the learning from here is once again, time management and don't ask more than one extension when you do special issue or else, you know, might end up like this one. And obviously the paper might not be as strong to other paper as well. Next thing to think about is the minimum and maximum words of the paper. Some journal is 6,000 words, some journal is 8,000, some journal is 12,000, some journal say 45 pages, some say 50 pages. So is it words or pages? This is something that we have to learn and something that have to, to make sure that you can manage in the word count. But what really, really interesting is not about the word count, it's about the paper. When we submit, this is one trick that you can learn uh, and use. So most of the journal, we have one pattern that is very similar when it's come to special issue. Then we have a minimum paper that is, can be accept and considered as a special issue. And then we have a maximum of how many paper can be accepted in that special issue. Say, for example, if there can be 10 paper in this, in this special issue. So you will notice that, okay, if there are too many people submit the paper there, then you might have a less likely chance of your paper to be accepted in this specific like, you know, special issue. Some journal might publish two issue for that special issue if they receive a lot of journal, a lot of papers. Uh, some journal will just say, okay, we just accept 10%. Or some journal will just say, are oh, we not going to accept more than 10 paper? It depends on the way they want to manage that journal. Um, I'm not gonna talk about what's right or wrong, but that is how it's managing right now. Um, the maximum is not too much of our concern. The concern is a minimum. A lot of the special issue would have a minimum of say six paper or four paper to be published as a special issue. If you find out that some of the journal you know, would need at least four or six paper to publish as, as a special issue. You can know this by looking at that previous special issue of the last few years, and then you can see the pattern. You can see that, okay, what is a minimum? And therefore, if that special issue is so, 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 so niche that not many people would submit a paper in, 
then you would have a higher chance in submitting a paper to that specific special issue. This same thing can be applied when we you know, send a paper to a conference because conference have many track, right? And different track might have a different number of paper that is submitted to. But at the end of the day, they need a minimum paper for them to accept and let the author to go and present. So it is very important to understand what is the minimum number of the paper that they can be, you know, that can, that they have to accept. I have to use the word that they have to accept. There was one time that I ran, I ran one special issue, which there were eight papers submitted. And eventually most of them got accepted just because of we don't receive enough um, paper. And we talk about, you know, high impact factor journal here. Uh -huh. Next one is know the author, meaning know the key author in that area. So in a special issue, because it's so special in a specific area, we should acknowledge and cite the author in those areas. Next one is to know the guest editor, know their style, know their writing style. There are some journals that prefer UK writing style, some journals that prefer US writing style. So we have to be very careful with that. Some journal editor prefer to have no zero in front of the dot. Some people okay with that. So, so we have to be you know, understand, understand what the journal preferred and all that. There are some journal editor that's so picky. There are some that is not picky at all. So it depends on what is your target journal. So this is something to learn and, and understand. And obviously, if you submit a paper to a special issue, try to acknowledge the work of the guest editor as well, giving that is relevant to what you are doing. Um, next one is a conversation with the journal. I'm trying to be polite and using the word conversation with the journals. At the end of the day, what it's saying here is that it means cite that journal that you are targeting in. Um, in my opinion, this is um, sometimes we are going to a wrong direction where we have to cite a journal just because um, we want it to be accepted. But if the conversation is right, if we really need to cite that journal and paper, then it's good. But at, at, as a bottom line, please you know, create some conversation with the journal that you are targeting in. Looking at what are some of their call for action, look at some of their, you know, suggested research area. That's might be where you can refer to your, your journals and all that. And then link your paper to the special issue, but do not copy the name of the special issue. One fourth of the title have the word AI 2.0 into it. Now, when I look at one paper, it looks fine. But when I look at 10, 20 paper with the word AI 2.0, it's, it's feel like, oh, you know, something, there's something funny going on that everybody going with AI 2.0. So, you know, sometimes we might have to be creative not to use something that it will be repetitive by other people. So this is something to, to think about. Now, I don't think your paper will be rejected just because of the name, but it just... Uh, it is a funny feeling when you, you look at it and sometimes it might lead to a bad perception. Perception is something very important when you submit a paper, when we submit a paper to a journal because a journal editor might take less than say 10 minutes to read a paper before they make that decision that they want to desk reject. Now it might take them just 10 minutes to make the decision to make uh, the decision to desk reject or to send to review or reject but they might take one hour to read your paper. But the first 10 minutes, they already formed the decision. The rest of the hour, looking at the justification on how to reject this specific paper. So create a good impression when we submit a paper with the cover letter, with the title, with the abstract, with the framework. It's very important with the uh, contribution of the paper. Now, one thing that I learned from my dad, so um, um, Park is from Thailand. So this is a Thai language. So the, the statement here is written that if we can hold our anger for one minute, we might be able to escape from the sadness for the next 100 days. What does it mean here? It means that if we get so upset because of a rejection or whatever, and we send an email to the editor saying, I'm very upset, and then you send an email, like very rude one to the editor, you have an argument, the editor got upset, then you might feel sad for the next 100 days that you know you can no longer submit paper to this journal or whatever. And this is applied to the family as well. If you are upset for one minute, please don't yell to you know your partner. Otherwise, I might be upset for the next 100 days. This is something that applied to my family. So I try not to yell to my wife at all.
And let's have a look at the co-creation discussion section. So in this case here, I would like to welcome, by the way, we still have another, you know, uh, half to go. In this section here, I just want to ask the audience if you have any questions or anything that you want to discuss about, especially those things that we have came across um, earlier this afternoon. The next part of the class, sorry, the next class of part of the session will be about tips and strategy for the um, revision. So for, for here is about what we have learned earlier on just now. Now, there is one comment in the chat is saying, does a special issue take less time than a regular issue? Um, the answer to this uh, is depend to the journal. But most of the time, the regular issue, sorry, most of the time, the special issue, we take less time uh, in general because they have a specific date. Uh, majority of the time, the special issue have the specific date that they have to publish um, their journals. Like, for example, the journal that I'm the associate editor with, before we propose a special issue, we have to talk to the publisher and say, this special issue, we're going to publish at what issue? So we have to be very specific. Therefore, the your paper will definitely be accepted or rejected within a specific time frame. So I think in my opinion, special issue will take less time than a regular issue. The next question is, is special issue uh, easier to, is it easier to be published in a special issue than a regular issue? In my opinion, I think if that special issue is something that is really re relevant to what you are doing, you have a higher chance because it's a call for action in those specific area. Um, it's also... Um, it's also quite important to uh, understand what is the aim of that special issue because sometimes the aim of that special issue too, is to explore a few specific aspects. If your paper or project can answer those specific aspects, then you will be able to, you will have an easier time there. And also it depends on the number of the people that submit paper to the special issue like mentioned earlier on. So if a lot of people submit a paper to that special issue and that special issue have a, a maximum paper that can be accepted, then it will be, sometimes it will be tougher. When I was a guest editor for one of the journal, I have, uh, at that time I still was a junior uh, academic. I have been instructed by the journal editor saying very clear that the exception rate cannot be more than 10%, no matter what and also cannot accept paper more than whatever number. This is a very specific um, statement from the journal editor. Whether it's ethical or not ethical, that is up for debate, but yeah. So, so it depends. If not many people submit a paper, I think it's easier. Um, sometime in, in, the rec, uh, in the special issue, you can also, we can also send an email and ask journal, uh, the guest editor, like, okay, here's an idea, here's a paper, what are some of your suggestions? What I find when I submit a paper to a special issue is that if I have a conversation with the guest editor first, he has a plan, he has what I want to do. What do you think? If it's not good, how to make it better? Therefore, try to work with the guest editor from a very early stage and try to get his or her input and try to you know, incorporate where it's possible. And eventually most of the time it's get accepted. Um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of when I, I actually have just one or two bad experience when I submit a paper to a special issue. Um, the rest is, is pretty good. So if I have a choice, I would submit my paper to a, a, a special issue first. Perfect. Please feel free to open your microphone or um, yeah, and have a chat. Yes. Elena, you can go first and then Ben can go next. Oh, thank you so much. I just want your opinion about some uh, issue I have with my first article. I'm a student of Master of Professional Study Research. Yes. And for Master, it's only one submission and one publication. So uh, I was submitted uh, to a journal three months ago. For 11 weeks, it was waiting for reviewer. Yes. For one week, it's waiting for publishing editor um, decision. OK. So what I receive in three months of waiting, that's rejection. Oh. Okay. 10 very brief, very wide comments. Yes. Such as, for example, um, layout, formatting, references not appropriate. And I actually pay 135 US dollars to 
editing and formatting services for specific that journal. Yes. So what I'm just done, I just send them a very straightforward email. I just said, look, I'm not arguing about this journal uh, or my paper. I just want some clarification. Mm, yes. How come you in my return email advertising this particular formatting and editing services, even I pay money before, follow every single requirements of that mm, um, yes. editing. And um, so in one week, I received from managers some email like she will pass on to um, editor to make a decision. So yesterday I sent again, very, very thorough email, making like a um, summary of the case, 10 steps. Step number one, when we submit the step number two, so we never have a peer review, three months of waiting, desk rejection, pay money before. And um, they actually sent me today very short email, like it will be meeting and there will be discussed mm. the paper. So what do you think in your opinion happened in this particular instance? So looking from the, first of all, thank you for the story and the discussion. I think that's quite interesting. Now, let me tell you first, when I was a PhD student, I had the same experience, uh, except that I did not pay the money uh, to, to do the editing. There was no money at the time. So uh, at that time, there was a journal in, in marketing and it's a good journal, um, second tier. Um, basically, it went for submission for four months, three to four months. I cannot remember exactly. It came back with a desk rejection, which I got so pissed off. And then I talked to um, the dean of research at my university at that time, 10 plus years ago. The dean told me that don't take any action um, as in like, just let it go because we can't really fight with a journal editor anyway. And secondly, I found out that the dean is a close friend of the journal editor as well. So what I learned from that instance is that the world is very small, especially in the specific small area of say marketing. Now, in your specific case, uh, you mentioned that the paper is, uh, say, waiting for um, reviewer selection. It depends on the name of the, the keyword that you that they use in a journal. So if they just uh, desk reject without any real comment from two reviewers, so probably that is actually got desk reject and they just take too much time to, to send out to review. What you could do in this case is that you try to avoid that journal for, for the future because if it takes too long, you do not have a good experience, don't submit a paper to that journal again. And then, you know, you can tell a story to your future PhD student. <laughs> yeah, and thank you. also when you become the editor, learn from that and not do that experience to other people. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Wen, sorry for waiting. Please uh, uh, welcome your question, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, do you think like uh, if I... I'm interested in a journal. Should I wait for a special issue or I should just submit as a normal paper? So is there any higher chance for special issue than normal one? Thank you for the question. So there are two questions there. Uh, one is, uh, is special issues easier or not? Um, mm -hmm. So it can be yes and no, but in general, I think special issue, if it, if it linked to your niche, I think you would have more chance. Uh, to to what you are doing, if the special issue is relevant to exactly like what you're doing. Now, the second question, which is quite important, you're asking, should you wait for this for the journal that you really wanted to submit paper to, mm -hmm. do a call for paper or special issue? Um, I normally will not wait because I don't know when it's going to happen. Well, what you could do is you could send an email, talk to the journal editor, and saying, "This is my paper. This is my idea. Here's a contribution." Um, I would like to submit my paper to your journal. What is your suggestion? Um, mm -hmm. He or she might say, okay, please go ahead, submit to a regular issue. Or you can add another question and say, is there any specific special issue coming up that is relevant to this, uh, to your paper? You could do that as well. Normally journal have to plan ahead about 12 months, about you know six to, six to 18 months for a special issue. So the editor might know that what are coming out, but they might have at but they might not yet advertise that.
when we're going to submit a paper to the second round of review, the trick that my team and I use a lot is providing the extra contribution. In another word, providing the unexpected contribution to the journals. So in a second round of review, a lot of the time they will tell us, uh, the editor review will tell us what they hope for us to prove, improve uh, or change. They will list the comments and all that. Okay, we do all of them. If you can, and if you think it's fair to do, you do all of them. But what we want is we want to also provide the extra contribution, basically extra value to your paper. And that's every time that I use, uh, except one time, the paper gets accepted. So here are some of the tricks that I use. First of all, this part here could be in your introduction or the literature review, like the first part of literature review. Uh, basically, this is a graph that my team added into one of our paper. Basically, we talk about the reason on why do we need this paper. Most of the time when you craft a research paper, you need to have a section talking about why this research is important, right? So I use this, we use this graph to justify that the research in this specific area is getting very high. Therefore, we need to do a conceptual review or we need to do a review paper on this specific topic right now because of the trend is high. So this is one strategy. Next strategy is to add in, um, in a literature review section. Um, this is for empirical paper, like when you do interview, survey, those type of things. Um, we have added in, in the literature review, like basically it's like a summary of a literature review in that area. The editor didn't ask for it, but we feel like mm, we want to find, you know, want, you want to add more value to the paper. Therefore, we have to, we have created like a, a, a simple table that summarizes the key research in those area, the key paper that you have used, you know, and you summarize. And at the end of the table, you might, you might have some, some something interesting to discuss and talk about it. And this table should be a table that add more value to your argument in your literature review. All right. Probably could be about the construct or the concept that you're using. Um, yeah. The table is actually very long. This is four pages long in this table. So, you know, this is an example there. Next one is uh, when you um, use case study approach. This is part of the implication of the paper. So you know how you have the theoretical implication and practical implication. This is where we put in in the practical implication. So imagine after the finding. So so your research sometimes have a framework and all that. So we have a framework and then we we already proved the framework. And in the practical implication, we have a table talking about how real business do things. So we're saying, okay, our finding A, B, and C is like this. And is it go along with what the real business are doing in the today world? So basically, not just talk about the implication of your research, but you link your implication to what business are actually doing. So this is a very good way to bring uh, the real implication of what business are doing into your research paper. Because a lot of the time, research paper do not have a strong implication of the practice. This is one way. Use a case study of real business approach. Next one. This is when you use survey study. So basically, um, this, uh, this framework here, circle here, uh, what happened in this paper was that uh, the editor asked for more value to be added into the paper. And obviously, you want to already correct the data. Sometimes it's hard to add more construct and, and add more framework and all that. So what we did in this paper is that we conducted a multimodal analysis. So with the same um, um, data set, luckily, we got about 3,000 uh, participants in this survey. So therefore, we can test a few different models. And we also, um, we test a few different models to see what is the best model that it would be suitable. Okay, so this strategy, to be honest, this is more like um, a band-aid strategy. Like <laughs> you really not fix anything uh, real, but you try to you know put a band-aid on, on, on your paper and try to hopefully that is add a little bit of value into it. Next one here is um, when you have a large sample size that you can group uh, your sample into different groups. Like you have 
In this case, we, we test difference between behavior pattern or usage pattern of the internet service provider. So in this research here, we're looking at the light user of the internet, the medium user of the internet, and heavy user of the internet. The different, um, basically the different um, on their behavior of the light user, medium user, and heavy user. So we just use segmentation analysis as a way to add value in this example here. Um, in the traditional, we should have at least 250 sample per groups uh, when we use, uh, you know, structure, structure equation modeling and all that. But some people say smart POS and all could use a lower sample size, but that up for a debate again, for, for which, um, which, what is it called? which discipline you are in. Now, last one here, this is one that I think all of us can do. And uh, it's actually very powerful from what I, from, from what I, um, the comment that I received back, okay? So basically at the end of the paper, we tend to have um, conclusion, future research direction, conclusion, limitation, and future research direction. So our team trying to make the future research direction to be more meaningful. Like we don't just say, oh, this paper you survey, therefore we should use other things. Or oh, this paper conduct the data from this country, therefore we use other things. Or oh, we, we miss some construct. Yes, we say that, but we have a much bigger meaningful section about future research direction. Um, given that you have done a proper literature review and you have some unique selling point from your findings, you can come up with a list of example of the future recommendation for the future research direction, like, you know, research questions and all that. Now, what I learned, I spoke to about three, four editor uh, when I did this um, strategy, all of them saying that this type of tables and figure will give the journal more citation. Therefore, the review were actually really happy with it. So I think when we uh, give some type of this future recommendation for, for research question is good for the journal, good for the author, good for the PhD student when they read or get, get new ideas, and good for you too. Because some of these research question, I would assume will link to your future paper or future project. So when you do a future project, you can then say, hey, look, this paper have a call for action this table to me is called call for action. So there's a call for action to explore something and then you can refer back to this. So this is a way you create a story from one project to another project. So this is good. Um, this is another example of the additional future research direction from another study. So the previous example was a table, right? This example is a paragraph. This table is a figure. So this is something that very important. Now, in my opinion, you don't need to have these many <laughs> uh, recommendations. Uh, I think just six, seven is more than enough. Uh, this one is a little bit go overboard, but my team at the time feel like it's a need and a must to do. So, so this is up to you. And to believe it or not, I find that we get a very strong, very strong citation out of that part. If you go, you know, uh, about two years after your publication, you can go and see the feedback, whether you get good citation or not. Providing a good experience for reviewer and reader. Now, in my marketing discipline, I'm teaching customer experience. So when I was teaching that course, I'm thinking of how I'm going to provide a good experience to the reviewer and the reader of our journals and papers. Now, keep in mind that um, the, the first target market here that we're going to sell is a reviewer, but we also, eventually, we're going to sell our paper, paper to the reader. The reader here could be from business, could be uh, anyone, like academic and all that. But when I do a paper, the aim was to write a paper that majority of the people can easily understand. So... Uh, so they can use it. It can be more meaningful and all that. But first of all, let's have a chat about good experience for reviewer. At the end of the day, remember that reviewer are human and human have emotion. And when they have emotion, they can make decision uh, negatively against us or positively against us. The example that I did not acknowledge one of the reviewer earlier on today show that that reviewer got pissed with me and then made the decision to reject the paper 
ordered the paper is good, but he rejected it based on that I did not follow his recommendation, his or her recommendation project. Therefore, we should make a good experience for them. Now, what we do in my team is we use colors and tone to influence them to make a positive feeling. Let's have a look. Here is an example of two different colors. Now, the reason why I use a highlight here so that it's clear in this presentation. Now, it could be a highlight or it can be just change the text color, depend on the journal requirement, or you might not highlight it at all, depending on the discipline, because some journals say don't highlight anything. I just want to show you a difference between two colors of yellow and blue. Now, if I'm not wrong, um, so basically blue color is a representative of cold color and yellow color is a representative of hot color. By looking at these two pictures, I'm sure that you can tell yourself which one gives you a positive experience. Majority of us would go with the blue color. So therefore, if you have a choice between yellow and blue, please go with the blue. Uh, keep in mind that you can change the text color to blue, not the highlight. I normally not highlight it now. I just change the text color to blue because it's easier. I mean, dark blue is easier for the reviewer to see. Some people, you know, comment that oh, highlight like this is hard, can't see. Next page here, example of red and green. Red is a hot color. Green is a cool color. I think without a doubt, red color is a bad, bad, bad option. I have seen some people highlight it like this. I look at it and was like, oh, this is even worse than the first version that I have seen. I mean, I have not even read it yet, but my perception already said that this is a bad thing. Red color is represent when, you know, teacher marks something in red. So we should not go in red. If you want, go with green or blue, like the example like just now. Um, okay, so this is just an example of the colors. Now this is, uh, I did an analysis using the, um, facial recognition, and this is a using specifically this one using heat map from eyes tracking lab. The picture or the one that say effective writing style. So that is when you write a sentence and statement using emotion, using feeling, using mood in your writing. So you're writing using mood and emotion as part of the writing. Uh, the one on the other side is called cognitive writing style. So that's when you use information, you use fact and you use number. Easy example is that when you say 50% of so-and-so, 50% uh, of participants say so-and-so and so. -and -so. so that is an example of using fact. Based from the eyes tracking of the heat map, you can see that people who, uh, when we write in the effective writing style, which is emotion, people will pay attention throughout the paragraph. You look at the first paragraph and second paragraph, the red color, the, the stronger the red, the more attention have been paid from their eyes. So it means people actually read everything um, for the, uh, when we're using emotion. But we notice that people start to read less and less after you know, a few paragraphs. So what is showing here, it's showing here that we should break down paragraph for subsection as well. So don't have a very long section with our subsection. So you should have a subheadings and all that to break down the paragraph and people can refocus their eyes. The example of the other side, the cognitive writing style using the emotion and fact. You will notice that wherever that it have a mention of a number or a fact, people pay really good attention on the number and the fact. But after that, they not pay much attention. So therefore, you can see which type of writing style is better to your audience. I'm not saying which is better. I'm saying what is better for your audience. So this is something for us to look at. But what we can learn from this page here is also showing that people will lose their attention after a while of writing. So we always must have a breakdown of a section so that people will you know, refocus again. of the language and strategy in crafting the response document. Okay, so uh, here is my um, response document when I do a revision to a journal articles. The yellow colors is mean the point of attention that I have to talk about because without the point of attention, I will forget what I should talk about with you guys. <laughs> Simple as that. So first of all, we had to write in a very formal style. You know, the, the first part of the attention, we had to come up with a very, you know, your headings and then the, the number of revision. 
acknowledge the journal editor and all that here, and then the comment of the journal editor. A lot of the time, we tend to miss the comment from the journal editor that is you know, writing in the, the, the document. We must make sure we acknowledge or the editor in this comment. Even the journal editor say, please follow the comment of the reviewer. Copy and paste that statement and put it there and say, thank you so much, da, 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 what we have changed, all right? Be very clear. Next thing I do is that I list each comment one by one. I don't change a word. Uh, even there is a typo, even this doesn't make sense, I do not change a word. I not touch, not change anything. Copy and paste into your document. And for me, I make it italic, so it looks different. Or uh, some people just use the word comment here and then the statement, and then you have a response. So the key here is do not combine comment between reviewer one, two, and three. Never ever combine comment because some people will feel, some people will feel pissed off when you combine the comment because they feel like you need not acknowledge them. So don't combine the comment, even it's a repeat com comment. Next one is to respond the comment. You have a we are say respond and we acknowledge first. Thank you so much for so long. So thank you so much for picking this up. We acknowledge your, you know, pre-working comment and all that. So just be nice to them and then explain what have you done? Like what action have you taken? For example, or we have changed this and that uh, because of so-and-so. We have adding this and that. And then what you could do is, what I would do is copy and paste exactly what I have changed in the main document to here. Like this part here is exactly in paste, copy and paste exactly. There are some journal that you can highlight the document. Uh, there are some journal that you cannot highlight the document. They call it unmarked document. A lot of the journal from that uh, Taylor something, something, the blue color publisher cannot highlight the document. So you will have to show your changes in the revision document. Now, one thing here that I learned a few years ago that is really shocked me, like really, really shocked me. When I went to one of the conference, there were a, converse, there were a special session about revision. And half of the people in the room who have done the revision said that they never looking at the full document during the revision. They only look at the revision note. So when I learned that, I feel like, oh, so if I did not make this revision note clear, then my revision probably will be rejected. So what I have to do, what we have to do is to make sure that this document here will explain every single thing that you have done. So I copy every single thing that I have done into this document to make sure that it's easiest for the reviewer to read and follow. So you have to understand which journal let you highlight your changes, which journal not let you highlight your changes. But in any cases, whether they let you highlight or not, I always copy and paste what I have changed in this document. And I also sometimes put in the page number, like page 15 to 25 and all that. But sometimes it's annoying because uh, you might have to go and change the page and update that if you, you know, change anything. All right, I want to move on. Uh, I'm not sure how many of us here have used chat GPT in helping you write journals. I actually just tried this last month, but my team have tried this a few months already. But I'm the only one in the team that don't like chat GPT. I did news about it, funny enough, but I haven't used it yet. So therefore, um, I tried. You can see you can see the history here of, of chat GPT. I tried. Uh, good thing is it's, it's free for the time being. All right. You just register your account and it's free. What I did was here, what I do is I check English. So what I do is I type in here, English check. And I type in one statement Yeah, You don't have to read here, all right? You, you don't have to read. But the point here is that I use ChatGPT to restructure my statement in a more professional way. So it's actually helped to pick up any mistake. It's helped to suggest some recommendation and all that. But some of the limitation to remember is first, the ChatGPT is a database. Therefore, it might not update to a level. So in this database here is update to 2021. Therefore, some information might be outdated. And also it's saying here in the first one that occasionally is will generate incorrect information. I actually, three days ago, I actually tried to, I, I written a statement, like a, a big paragraph for a literature review. And I asked ChatGPT to find references for me 
funny enough, they found references uh, for all of the part that need reference. But I found out also that all of these references are fake. So basically, it's just a fake reference. <laughs> so the funny thing is the chat GPT found a reference, but it's just a fake reference that the chat GPT made up. So to me, don't use chat GPT to create reference for you, but you can use chat GPT to you know, make the, the help you with the structure. Sometimes when I written grant, I have I asked ChatGPT to, you know, restructure some of the statement for me. Yeah, like you copy and paste one paragraph at a time if you feel like comfortable doing it. All right. Now, one last thing I want to talk about today before we go on to the module website, before we go on the whole creation uh, discussion section is your motivation. Today's topic is about how to get your revision accepted 88% of the time. And when I ask myself and some of my friends, what is the strongest strategy or the best strategy? The answer is, what is your motivation to do it from the first place? If you do paper, just a sake of what to have one, two, three more, you know, just a sake of having paper, then don't do it. Do it because there is a real motivation out of it. Like you want to explore something. You want to add something to the body of the literature review. You're doing it because you love writing. You're doing it because you want to solve some problem. You're doing it because it's part of the grant agreement that you have to do it. You're doing it for the sake of having a job in the future, or you're doing it for your family to have a you know, job and all that. Now, and my current motivation right now when I do papers with my PhD candidate is, especially if they want to be an academic, obviously we know that you need some papers and some good teaching and some other things and service and all that. I'm trying to do my best to motivate them to publish in journal articles so that you can, they can get a job in the university that they want. What I want to do is I want to give them the freedom of choice. The word freedom of choice here has been choice to be the in the, choice to be in the industry choice to be in the academic, in the university that they want to be. If they don't have enough paper, they will not have this freedom of choice and they will be forced to do something that they don't want to do. So these are some of my motivations, apart from my family, of course. You have to find out what is your motivation in doing this, you know. Anyone have a questions? Mark, I don't know if you can hear me, but it's just Angela Bolt here. Um, Hello, Angela. From, yes, I can hear you. Um, Griffith and Uni SQ. Um, thank you for the session. Sorry for joining late after my teaching. And I am just driving home from Brisbane at the moment. Um, but I did just have a question. If you had three tips for, for when you get started on an article, so that sort of first, you know, couple of hours of work or a couple of days of work on an article, do you have any suggestions on getting underway with structuring and organizing and conceptualizing um, the approach to the article? I love your question, Angela. Now, drive safe while listening, okay? So uh, three tips when starting a new paper or new project. So first of all, um, the new pro first tips is that uh, if you're going to start a fresh new project, not from anyone PhD, so a fresh new project, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go and read some call for paper. So what I do is I search on Google and I search with call for paper in a specific area. And then some of that call for paper would pop up. All right. So I will, I will follow those call for paper um, suggestion. Second one is that I will read some uh, review paper. So a lot of the time, the top journal in business we call A-star, they do have a review paper and then they have a list of you know suggested um, research question or research area. I would go and explore those areas and see if it's relevant to what uh, the team want to do or myself want to do or solve the problem, then, then I would do that. So what the, the first tips is to try to find out a, a, a meaningful call for action, call for paper from what is already there in the literature review. Second tips here is that I would say, um, try to create your, um, when you're gonna create a paper or project, have a, a structured outline first, like I have like a skeleton outline of UK, what will be the headings for the whole paper so that you can plan it accordingly. And then you can, you know, have a, have a you know right person for each of the section uh, so that is will help you with the planning now the third 
tips that I would give you, which I don't have one yet. So <laughs> the first tip is that I would say pick a topic that is really interest you and not do it just because of publishing, because you should be known for a specific topic and that topic should be, you know, helpful to the uh, society. Yes. So that would be the first three tips. Amazing. Thanks so much, Park. That's um, some really good food for thought and a good way of tackling by looking what's around and out there and calls for paper. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Angela. Do we have, uh, thank you so much for that. So we have any more questions that would like to join in the conversation? Very happy to, to answer any of that. Okay, there's one question on how far into your PhD do you recommend starting to try publishing? Um, this is a great question. So the first one is, do you want to be in the academic or not? Because if you want to be in the industry, there's no rush to do publication, but it's good to have one or two before you um, finish your PhD. Therefore, I would say, um, in if, if you are a business, I would say from year two, maybe starting to, uh, once you have some data collected and, and analyzed, you can start to do some publication in year two. Um, in year one, like late year one, if you want to do, maybe it's like a, um, would be like a conceptual review paper, meta analysis paper, literature review paper. So in year one, normally will be like a conceptual review paper. So that is what my PhD candidate would do, which is in year one, they're going to do a review paper. The good thing about review paper is that it's going to serve as a foundation of your um, literature review in your PhD and also going to give you a very strong citation. Uh, most of my high cited paper is come from... Um, conceptual review or a literature review paper. So it's, it's very good. So so so, so it give, gives you a good foundation. So I would say end of year one or early year two, you do the uh, review paper. And then once you have some good fighting from your PhD, then you start to um, publish uh, from year two or year three. Yes. I would recommend not to wait until you finish your PhD to start doing paper. Because in the old day, 10 years ago, there used to be a saying that, okay, let's do papers after we submit our thesis. The problem with that is the paper take time. And when the job opportunity turn up, if you don't have any paper at all, it might be tricky for us to get the job in the current situation. It's not the case 20 years ago or 10 years ago, but nowadays, if we want to get a job, maybe we need one or two or three papers before we get a job. In some discipline, need even more than that, but yes. But yeah, I think your supervisor will be able to um, share more experience there in that sense, yes. Thank you so much for those uh, who mentioning is a good session. I'm pleased to hear and glad to hear as well.